Well, welcome everybody, Monday evening. I'm excited to be the host for this evening, uh, an audience with, uh, and, and let me assure you, the, the deliberation that this gentleman had, whether he should speak when he was asked to, um, it was a, a bit of arm twisting that went on. Uh, we've had some incredible speakers from the field over the last month or so since this gentleman has been heading up the UK corporately. And we've seen success story after success story that have been in the industry for a number of years, people that have been with the company for a number of years. But I, I thought it'd be great to get this gentleman on so we could actually speak to him and ask him some direct questions and find out a little bit more about the man behind all the hard work that's going on here in the United Kingdom. And so tonight, for those who don't know that man, wherever he is on your screen, he's on my top left-hand corner, is a gentleman called Steve Morley. Now, Steve and I go back a number of years, and he was someone that I admired in a corporate role many, many, many years ago. So, but, you know, I crossed paths with him only a few short months ago, uh, back end of 2019, for a, just a coffee, just have a conversation, and the rest is history. But that progressed very, very quickly into what we have today. And Steve, that's so great to have you on the call. Why don't you just say hi to everyone this evening while I, I just make sure everything's muted out. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, great to be on the call. Thanks for joining. I hope you had a great Monday. What a beautiful, warm day it was today, hey? Um, again, June is fantastic results already. Uh, May was 50% above April, April 50% above March. So you're all doing a fantastic job. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you tonight. So Steve, let's, let's kick off. We've got now almost uh, 70 people on the call. So keep sending people reminders to join us this evening. Uh, and we say we go back a long way. We, we go back many decades. I mean, I, I don't even like the sound of that, but we go back many decades. In fact, 30 years we go back. So tell me, when I first met you, you were a young, okay, you were a boy and you were just entering the industry. But I'd like for those who don't know of you, or they obviously know your title, Steve Morley, National Sales Director or Sales Director for United Kingdom and Ireland. But it's interesting to know where people come from because a bit like the field, they look at some of the leadership that we've seen before, not knowing their true story of how they have arrived in this position. So why don't you just share a little bit about your 30 years in the industry uh, and how you got started? Uh, great. Okay. So basically, I was okay at school, but not great. I did end up doing a degree, but years and years later through the Open University. At school, wasn't really my thing. I was more into football and uh, running and, and things like that, as some people are. My mum and dad were not that way inclined. They just let kids be kids and stuff. I'm a bit different to that with mine, but that's another story. Um, I went, I went to Central, well, it's, it's London College of Fashion. I left school, went straight there, and to be honest, I wasn't very good. My molars for going were not closed. And after about maybe a year, um, it was like holidays, and my dad, who worked for logistics in one of the big MLM companies, basically said, come and work with us um, for six weeks over the summer holiday and some money. So after kind of three or four weeks, I was working in a warehouse, um, and to be honest, it was the first time I earned money. Um, it was full of entrepreneurs who I was meeting every day. And honestly, I fell in love with the industry as a baby. And I kind of felt, always felt I was like a baby to this industry. Uh, from there though, I knew I wanted to work hard. So to cut a long story short, uh, 14 years later, I kind of got promoted, I think 11 or 12 times. And I, I was basically in charge of sales and mark well sales for the biggest mlm in europe and after so long there i i learned a lot i'd met some great people but i wasn't learning new things and i wanted to learn new things so from that i was headhunted from the largest public uh, company in our industry and i worked there uh, in uk and europe for three years and again it wasn't as fun as the first company. And I didn't want to jump companies too much, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was about 33 years old. I'm, I'm 48 now. And then uh, opportunity struck. And basically, 
I was uh, again contacted by a Chinese company, a Chinese company who are in our industry, who today are the biggest company in our industry in China. And my job was to develop the UK market. And we got a couple of thousand going to meetings within a year, which, which is pretty good for any company. And then I got offered the role of Europe, Dave, which was um, basically launching 27 markets in a year which is the Chinese way of doing things. And it's nowhere near as good as what we're doing with ours. We can come back to that later. Um, and then I'd done that for about two and a half years. And then from there, I actually went to China and I was really the international guy who helped that company get a license in China, a license to operate. China, as you know, is 1.7 billion people. Um, and getting anything licensed is very difficult. There's a lot of politics over there. So I used to go around with the president of the company, basically meeting all the government officials from all the different provinces in China, um, talking nicely about the company. And it was a great company. So I was, you know, it was, it was, I, 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 I never had to tell an untruth. I never would, but it was, it was good fun. And then after about five years in total, I was like, okay, I, I want to start my own company. So I started a consultancy company um, in Singapore, it's a UK company, but I was based and moved to Singapore with my family. And then I moved to Hong Kong and basically spent seven years helping companies launch in Asia. The problem with that was two things. One, my family moved home. So I was basically doing eight, eight hour flights a month, two weeks here, two weeks in Asia. And, you know, my family were growing little bit by little bit. And it came to a point where my wife was enough's enough. And to be honest, it was because having a consultancy company, what I missed the most was the day to day support and working with other people, entrepreneurs and like minded people who wanted to develop Sank. So I thought I'm going to come home. And I made that decision. I took six months off and then we had our coffee day. But Steve, you know, you, you jumped a little bit from that 14 years and four years to China before I even had a chance to <laughs> ask you. You were in a full flow and I didn't want to stop you. But, uh, you know, those, you, you mentioned about your two companies that you represented and you acted at the highest level. Well, I think a lot of people need to understand that the first company you, uh, you worked with and progressed from a boy to man effectively in 14 years and then was solely responsible for sales throughout Europe is the largest still today in the industry. And we're not talking about just big, we're talking eight, nine billion dollars in volume a year. So that was a huge responsibility on the shoulders of a young man. But I guess growing up from the warehouse to the front line of responsibility, what would you say was this? Because you said you fell into it, right? You went to, you had a little taste of money, you chased the money that teased you in the warehouse. But I think a lot of people find themselves falling into network marketing in the field perspective as well, uh, not realizing how big it is. I mean, so what, was you, what would you say the biggest gr growth curve for you was in that, in that first company where you went from zero to 14 years? Where was it that you recognized that this was a professional industry and the caliber of individuals are far greater than the perception that people think it is? Okay. I mean, for me, it was going to my first event that was kind of outside of the company, but was run by entrepreneurs. I, I say it, it wasn't run by entrepreneurs. It was run by people who wanted to earn a, a second income or, or whatever, but they were very motivated. And I started reading books actually at that point. And honestly, I kind of, I, I think what I'd done, what I'd done looking back in hindsight, which really helped was I, I partnered or one, it always was. So when people were coming around and doing tours of the office and premises, I'd always make uh, the effort to go and meet these people and talk to them and introduce myself. You know, I mean, they didn't know me. They didn't really want to talk to me, but, but you start communicating like that and you build relationships pretty quickly. And that's certainly what got me through the different levels in the company wasn't um, anything but attitude. A attitude by far, work ethic, attitude was important in every role. So I think I, to go through the roles, give you an idea, it was like warehouse, uh, warehouse logistics, then it was 
customer service, recognition, events, compliance, sales, and, and such. That's kind of how it went. But at every level, I built relationships with people. And as well as having a good attitude with the company and learning from good people in the company, I think it was that balance and that, that relationship that kind of made, that made, that started my career. But it was really just seeing how people were supporting each other and at these events. It was just, for me, amazing. I had no other word for it. I remember vividly, Steve, one of the things I really recall about you from a corporate perspective was how you were a very intricate part of the cog that got the field and corporate gelling together. Uh, you know, there's a lot of companies in the industry that I've seen and been part of where that you wouldn't even think they were on the same team. They, they were against each other. So t tell me, share one of those philosophies or what your, your thought behind that is, you know, is corporate first or is field first? Are the field more important or is corporate more important? Because, you know, I will say this from this side of the fence, without us in the field, those in the corporate don't have a job, right? And those in the corporate, if they don't have a job, they will be supporting us in the field. So we've got to have that two-way respect. Uh, and so could you see through your career those who built a successful business and those who didn't, do you think that relationship element was a vital key to their success? It was, it's it's the, the most important thing is the field. There's no doubt, no doubt about it for the reasons you just say. But honestly, for me, it was all about, I, I didn't do it because I thought it was, that would get me through the levels and I would get recognized and all this. I didn't do it for that. I'd done it because of the heart. And I really like the people and I see how hard they were working in the field and not always were corporate, you know, supporting so much. So you're right. There was this complete non-alignment. So the field wanted to go this way, the company want to go this way and the company made decisions without always including the leaders and leadership. And you had this like broken record. I mean, it was there and it was growing just because of the sheer numbers, but no one liked each other at all. No one liked each other. So when I met you for that coffee, and the reason, and what was, I mean, the good thing I had coming to meet you for that coffee was the fact that I could, I, I, I wasn't rushing into anything. I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't um, desperate to do anything. I was having quite a nice holiday. I'll call it a holiday because it was. I mean, it was looking after the kids, spending time with them and stuff. And then we had that coffee, and you showed me that picture of Orion and Hilda. And I remember seeing them in Orlando seven years ago. I never spoke to them, but heard them on stage. And I thought, wow, I remember this couple. They, they, they were brilliant. I really enjoyed their presentation. I re so that was like a big tick in my box. And then talking to you about the customer side of things. I mean, that to me was incredible because I don't know another company in our industry that has one customer to partner. Not one. We have like 25 or so on average, probably more than that, customers to partners. And for me, that was just massive as well. So there was just a massive tick on the box. NASDAQ listed, massive tick on the box. The test, massive tick on the box. But what it gave me time to do is basically analyze every everything. And I can catch up. Are you okay? I'll carry on explaining how I made this. I'd like to ask you before you run away with the show. I know it's a Steve Morley show. But let me ask you a question first. That, yeah. uh, but but uh, he said, you, you know, Steve, when you, you, a lot of people on this call don't know how we came together in regards to short six months ago. And it was a coffee. And I, I would say you were beyond holiday in. Your hair was longer. You were relaxed. You, I mean, you were almost horizontal. Um, and if you actually, if you've ever, from a field perspective, sat in front of someone thinking this person is not looking for anything, Steve Morley was that person. And so I met him on a cold morning in Milton Keynes last October. And uh, I just shared with him, because uh, I, I knew he'd been in, and of course he's covered this, he was in China for 10 years. And I was actually going to meet him. I, I think how many of us have ever, from a field perspective, wanted to meet somebody for our own game? What's in it for me? I just want to, and I've been asking Steve for some Chinese connections for years. And so when I knew he was back in the United Kingdom, I thought I'd have a coffee with him. Just seeing if he would help me with a couple of names for China. Um, and he's sitting there and again, 
I didn't know. Unbeknown to me, I didn't know he had already had a connection. Though not knowing them, but he had a connection with the founders. And so, unbeknown to me, I just thought I was having a coffee. Uh, if nothing else, I'd love to get a customer out of this guy. Uh, and I'm sitting here, and um, he's paying too much interest in the two-minute video. I mean, his body language was leaning into it. And the thing he said to me was, he says, Dave, what we got, what you just showed me is what's been missing in United Kingdom for two decades. Real product for real customers. I didn't take it beyond that thinking, oh, maybe I'll get him as a partner. Maybe I'll get him on the team. And so as I walk out of the, 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 the restaurant and we part ways, I've given, I've done them, given the, the, the links to watch and I ring the founder. And I ring the founder and I said, I found, a, I think I found a real good influencer here. I'd love for you to get him on the call. And this is four days before our annual convention in uh, Globen, which is generally October, November. And uh, Orion says, can you get into the event? And I said, I didn't ask. So I didn't even ask. I'm a professional, right? I didn't even ask because I made the assumption he wouldn't be interested in going to the convention. It's at the weekend. And so he's, I, I rang Steve and said, Steve, are you, uh, what are you doing this weekend? And his words were, I knew you were going to ask me. He said, why? I said, because we got a convention in Sweden. He said, Dave, I can't make it. Can't make it. I'm busy Saturday. I've already got commitments to a charity. And I, my heart dropped. And he said, but I can fly Sunday. And I went, I mean, how many of you have ever experienced a euphoria moment? You think you've got someone and you've lost them. And it was like an emotional roller coaster. Well, he did fly out and I was flying home. He flew out, I flew home, I sat Steve Morley on the front row at the convention next to the founders, and I left them in the capable hands of Orion Seller. Now he is our national sales director, which is an incredible journey. But you started to explain, Steve, some of the things that you were attracted to about the company. But just, just build on that then is, you know, you're in holiday mode, you've done very well financially, your family want you back home for health reasons because of those multiple flights to China and back. So you were chilling, playing golf and eating well. What made you decide to really get off the couch? What made you to go, you know what? Because knowing what it took to build a 14 year company with a number one in company, and then the largest publicly held company and privately held companies, you knew what it was going to take. You knew it was, you weren't going in blind. So what made you, what, what moved you to go, you know what, I'm ready to go to work again? You know, it's a really good, it's a really good question. And, you know, for like the, tw the 28 years I worked, like I worked hard. I mean, I, I worked hard. And then those six months, my motto was definitely life is better in flip-flops. That was my motto in life. Like if I could have that for the rest of my life, I thought I'd be good. But honestly, after six months, and I needed it, I really needed it, okay? But after that time, it was like, okay, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna look, and if I find something, great, if I don't, great, but I'm gonna choose or certainly look through everything. So we done that and I went to Stockholm, and what I remember most about Stockholm was, again, the customer side, but more important than that, after, on the Sunday, it's so a three days, I know how hard people work for these events, Orion had dinner with me. So he could have been resting in his room, he could have been meeting other leaders. Instead, he had dinner with me for two hours on the Sunday. And I thought that is just re remarkable. I was, in, I was super impressed with that. And what he was talking about, his vision, and he talk, we talked about alignment. I mean, he, Orion and Hilda, it's just, you know, it's all to do with the field, the field, the field. How, how are our partners gonna, you know, what, what can we do to support them? It, it was amazing. And then from there, I met Dag, who's my boss, Dag Peterson. And this was interesting for me because I, I met him end of September and we were talking about the UK for two months, two months. Okay, which is incredible. He, he phoned my references. I'd done questionnaires. You would not believe the amount of discussion and things we had to do. I've, never, I've not done a CV in my life, ever. Never done a CV, but I had to do a CV. Let me, let me jump in here, though, Steve, because the communication, when you were filling out that documentation, you were messaging me going, what do you think? 
that they haven't answered my email. I've answered their questions. Do you think they're going to come and talk to me? Or what do you, I mean, you'd gone from not being interested to going to Global and to like going, I really am keen to do something here. Do you think they like my CV? So uh, that, they weren't his words, but you, you were like, <clears throat> you just wanted to get on with the job, right? You just wanted to get started. No, absolutely. And, you know, I'd, I'd done that with Dag. I'd gone to the office for a couple of days in Stockholm and met all the staff. And uh, what I liked internally was it was it's a very flat structure internally. So I really low. Po I've not experienced politics for six months and I dealt with politics for 28 years. But the thing I wanted to do the most was get back to when I was most happy in in the industry. And when I was most happy in the industry, it was when a market was starting off or just being developed. So I knew I had to get in the trenches. I knew I had to get up at 5 a.m. I knew I got a bed after the last message at night. And I was, um, I was happy to do that. And I wanted to do that because when you're like working for someone else or you are a consultant, you don't, you, you don't really care about the companies so much. You're just they, they want you to do something and you're helping them do that. That's your job. Your job isn't to do anything. So I hadn't gone to meetings or anything for years and years. So when I went to the Zenzino meeting, it brought back memories. But then when I heard how, how the business is positioned, I just thought, well, the UK, this is perfect. And that, that's really when I made the decision that I, I, I wanted to be part of this. And, you know, six months in, it's... Uh, I think we're going to do something special here, but it's it's really really a really amazing company. So so you you obviously got around the, the the leadership field leadership the founders. You got around an incredible CEO, which is one of the first times I've seen where the owners of a company actually have a, an incredible management team and leave them alone to do what they're employed to do, rather than put, you know getting involved all the time. Um, so you know, I mean, you know internally, you know more than anybody on this call right now. Um, we, we've got people on the call tonight from Slovakia, Holland, Europe. Uh, of course, you represent the United Kingdom and Ireland, but why don't you, why don't you share if you, what you can share? Uh, and I'm not saying I know anything than, that, more than you, but I would love to know what, what's the plans? What do you feel or what do you know of that, that plans for Zinzino for, uh, let's say, the rest of this year? We know what their long-term goal is. We know in the next few years, a million customers, 20 million customers, 100 million well, what do you see for the rest of 2020? Okay, I mean, continuous improvement is the kind of message I, I can, can continuously receive from the company and I endorse and support fully. In my world, what I'm most happy with is the expansion. Um, what's different is we've been around not 50 or 100 years, but we've got a foundation of, 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 of 10, 12 years now developing Europe and developing our products, the fed of developing our materials, et cetera. And now they want to launch and now we want to launch. And to be honest, I've seen the launch plans, you know, eight, nine countries this year is the plan with COVID. It might've been 10, 11. Um, but by the end of this year, we are basically going to be in more than half, you know, the world's population will have access to our products, maybe even 70%. So about four or 5 billion will with, with, Hong Kong opening, et cetera, and the access to China. But, you know, every market is a potential um, development for everybody. But the message I always say to everyone is develop your kind of local business first and then worry about Asia and other markets, you know, once you've built the local market, which here obviously is the UK. But for me, market expansion is, is a major thing for us as a company. I think we will, I mean, my, obviously we've talked about UK and, you know, we have six, 7,000 customers at the moment. I'd like to see that hit 200,000 by the end of next year. And my personal goal, which is not really a company goal, my personal goal is for Zinzino UK to be a household name. And the reason I say that is because I know all the direct selling companies out there. I've been involved in the direct selling association. I've been chairman of the conferences sometimes. So I understand it fully. And, you know, if there was a blueprint for our industry, I think Zinzino's business model would be the blueprint for that industry. But so international going back, international expansion is a main thing for us continuous improvement of the systems or the apps are being developed at the moment. There's new tests that are going to be launched this year, which are 
uh, very exciting, which I can't talk about at the moment. Um, but yeah, continuous improvement. But in the UK, it is really, it is really doubling, doubling, doubling the business. We are tiny. We are at 0.0001% in the UK at the moment. And that's, that's a fact. And that's what's exciting. So someone like yourself who's been part of those multi-billion dollar annual revenues, you've come out of <clears throat> holiday mode, retirement, you've seen what's possible, you've seen what can be achieved. You know, talk about maybe the culture of Zinzino. Maybe, you know, you, you, you now represent a, a managerial council each week. You've seen the other GMs around Europe. <clears throat> talk about maybe the, 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 the relationship internally from a corporate perspective, how, how they work together to make sure everybody's, it's one big, it is a one family attitude. People see the thing that's lip service, but those who work as one family, not with a scarcity mindset, but opening up to everyone, because I never know when I'm going to have people that I need supporting in Latvia or Russia or Ukraine or India. So rather than having that scarce mentality, what's the corporate mentality? Are the general managers just protecting their own interests? Or they, they, they're watching what you're doing, Steve, and they've obviously been impressed with what your first quarter's been like. Well, what, what is the real internal um, support of one another? Yeah, okay. I mean, the number one thing I won't ever do uh, is politics. I won't do politics, okay? And I won't tolerate politics, and everyone knows I won't do that. Um, I made it very clear, and everyone knows I'm only interested in UK and Ireland. So for me, I just, that, that's my line, that's what I wanna do, and I can't wait for this journey to continue. Um, in terms of internal, I mean, what, what, I mean, really brilliant, isn't it? You've got Rob Hawkins in Australia, who does his team calls, which we all go on. You have Thomas, you have Andrea, you have Kenneth in, in Singapore. I think for me, this, is, this might be interesting, for you, but Doug Peterson's my boss, and whenever he phones me, it's it's basically a few words. Anything I can do to help. That's it. Not what are your sales, what are you not doing right, what's any issues, what problem, what can I do to help? And we'll talk for five minutes, and then he'll come back, phone me, and we'll uh, and update me. That is the extent, really, of, uh, of the day-to-day -day things. I mean, strategically, yeah, we, we, we've seen the strategic plan, um, which for me is perfect in terms of going the right speed at the right time. Um, but yeah, no, for me, everyone works together. The corporate team know in the part of the culture is to support the field at all costs. And for me, it's, it's the, my favorite company I've worked for ever. That's what I, that's, I, I, I say that while being recorded. <laughs> well, you know, I, I like, uh, I love the, the uh, what Dag asks you is, what can I do to help? And the answer is, quite categorically, whatever we, we need to do to help the field. Well, the, it's, whatever the challenge of the day, it's whatever the challenges are. I mean, you have, the, you, have, you, have, you have challenges right now with deliveries and boxes breaking. So we're, we're fixing that. In, in, and, and so that's been fixed and we'll announce that soon. But most of them are little things because obviously the business model is proven. The yeah. business model is growing, but it's the little things which upset the field, which need to be dealt with. So that's one side of it. The other side is the things that help develop the business, like direct selling membership and uh, you know, social media and credibility and, and corporate things we can always do and lobby and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of, I do have that role, but my main role is to make sure you're happy. My main role is to make sure you're making money. That's it. Well, you, you, you started well, and I, uh, I, I hope that you continue to finish strong for 2020. But I've heard you ask a lot of the leadership when you've been interviewing Steve about how they've had to switch their mindset, maybe their thinking, their the daily operational activities from offline to online uh, because of obviously the global scenario of the, the health crisis. Um, what is your personal perspective on that in regards to as we start to ease, and who knows when that is will be for us in the United Kingdom, but as we start to ease, have you, do you feel how it's influenced us? How do you feel it's influenced us as an opportunity, as a community, as entrepreneurs, where do you see us coming out of the, the releasing of the movement around the United Kingdom? What, what, what is your take on it all? 
Yeah, okay. Well, I see two things. I, I see that for me, I, can t I talk about me and then maybe you, you agree, maybe you don't. This is my personal feeling. For me, I, I've been locked down. I have a kitchen office and I've had it for four months now. Okay. And to be honest, I miss the meeting people. I miss the traveling, but I, I don't miss it that much. I don't miss the car, the, the way, the train stations, all that stuff. I don't miss. And I think everyone's learned a really good skills like, you know, the, the, in this period with Zoom and other things. So I think if it used to be 80% um, 80 face-to-face -face meetings and 20% online, it'll probably be the other way around, apart from our big events, which we're going to do. Um, in terms of the business and UK and are coming out of lockdown, I mean, I, I'm concerned for the population in terms of people are, you know, furlough is still on, but companies are struggling, they're borrowing money that they're probably, I don't know what they're spending it on because they can't really sell anything. They can't buy much. And you see with the high street, it, it, it's, 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 it's a terrible hospitality event. My belief, and I may be wrong, is three months from now, the country will be struggling again. I mean, GDP went down 20% quarter one. This is the biggest... I think decrease ever. So, you know, it's, um, uh, people will need businesses like ours. They will. And with immune, I think the immune system and our products uh, are fantastic. But honestly, I think we will, I, I, we're already the fastest growing direct selling company in the UK by, by a million miles. And I know a lot of uh, companies are struggling and I, I don't like to see it. But, you know, we're young, we're dynamic, we have a simple but beautiful product. And, you know, I don't even get excited so much on testimonials, Dave. I get excited about the ingredients in the product and how it's put in there and the processes. It's, I'm kind of strange like that. I, I, I just love the quality side of things. Um, but, yeah, I think after a lot, we'll, we'll continue growing and I, I really worry for the economy. Um, it will be good for home-based businesses because more and more people be receptive to it. And I also think the number one word that used this year by everybody in UK is test. Is yeah. to, everyone's used that word test. No one's been out of test. And, you know, so I think even our oil and our test, people will be even more receptive to than they are today to see what's going on inside. So unless we continue more tests, even better. But, you know, there's, I can't... Okay, obviously, I'm not going to, I, I wouldn't just say stuff. So you know, I'll just tell it as it is. I can't fault the company at all in terms of me, in terms of my relationship with the company, how they are with me, the, you know, the Paul Clayton's of this world, the Orion's of this world, the comp plan, the, 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 the online, everything. I, I, I'm, I'm in love with the company, Dave. That's all I can, that's all I can say to you. Well, you know, the, the thought that's just as we wrap up, Steve, I'm going to ask you to maybe just close out. But the thought as you were sharing that is, you know, uh, I had a flashback of back to the future. OK, like, again, you've been with the billion dollar companies and here we are at the very beginning, you know, 80 plus million euros in sales last year, grew 53 percent publicly traded. So the foundation. But, you know, from the time we had that coffee, you are becoming more and more and more a corporate man again. I mean, <laughs> I'm glad you decided to go corporate because uh, here when you get excited about the ingredients is one thing. At least I know that and the word quality is something that's paramount. And I, I, I'm like you is I think there's people today that will be looking for opportunity that wouldn't have looked two years ago. Uh, not because they two years ago, they should have been looking. Why? Let's take that what we're experiencing out the equation. What we're experiencing today as a global pandemic is real. We are sadly seeing fatalities and loved ones, and that is re that's real. But the reality is, before that, was we were still the most unhealthiest in mankind's history, and people's financial independence and security was still vulnerable. What we've seen in this period is it's highlighted both. both. And so we should be, as a field, going out there very strong not putting it, throwing it down to people's throats, but showing them the possibilities of partnering with a company like Zinzino. So as you wrap this up, 
again, being back in the many, many, many decades ago in your, you mentioned going to your first convention. So we've got our convention coming up a week Saturday, our annual convention, our virtual leader school, which I went for the very first time last year with one person. I, it was me and another person, Dave Morrell. And we sat there drinking the incredible coffee they started there. By the way, let's all put to a petition. We want the coffee in United Kingdom. Okay, so let's uh, uh, make some noise in the comments. And so this is being recorded. So we can send this back to head office in Sweden. We want the coffee in the United Kingdom. But uh, I don't want to put you on the spot there, Steve. But just talk about the importance of what this virtual leadership school is for every one of us in the field. You've been to, you filled the NEC with leadership with tens, 20,000 people on a weekend in your very first company. What is the importance of the next a week Saturday for 2020 if people really want to say, you know, I want to finish 2020 way ahead of where I am right now. What's the importance of the leadership? I want you to close out on that and then I'll bring it to a close. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's probably the most important date of the year. It's more important than our launch event we'll have later this year. Uh, it's more important than annual conference because these are um, not just the best speakers in the world, but they're also friends of our founders. So when they talk, they are going to talk real. They are going to talk honest. And, you know, I, I'm going to have my children sitting with me watching this because it's important for, the, for, for them and for everyone to understand who we are, what we're doing, why, we, why we're doing it. So, yeah, I've got all I can say, Dave, is I've got my ticket. I will, I will be watching, and it is uh, an event not to be missed. It's going to be fantastic. Well, Steve, thanks for spending a little bit of time. I know some of them are starting to get to know you because they've been communicating with you. Uh, from the day you started, you said, I'm accessible. But one thing we've seen in the last two months is that your workload has gone through the roof. I mean, this is, just, this is not a nine to five individual. So he's definitely behind the scenes 24 seven. Uh, I can't wait for many people to get to know you like I got to know you in my early years. And it's been exciting for me to, with confidence, not just to have someone that I know in corporate, but I, to have someone in corporate that, that I, I say this respectfully, with competence. You know, that's the biggest thing that I have found in a lot of companies is that they had a lot of positional management, but they weren't competent to look after the needs of the field. And that here's a man that has the eyes and ears for us and is the communicator to the HQ in Sweden. So Stephen Morley, you probably haven't been called that since you were asked to leave education, but Steve Morley, thank you for being on the call this evening. We've enjoyed you. You're an incredible asset to the company. I'm truly thankful from a field perspective and uh, everybody just go get your virtual leadership ticket. By the way, if you're not aware of it, it's in your back office as soon as you land in your homepage. But here's something that we learned today on the director call, which we hold every Monday, is that those with tickets, every session of that Saturday for those in the main field, they will release for a period of time over the next coming weeks recordings that for those with ticket holders will be able to review and watch over again. So your 49 euros isn't for the day. Your 49 euros is for the day and to be able to re watch over and over again for a period of time. That's incredible content, incredible value. So Steve Morley, appreciate your time. I, and Steve actually arranges all the speakers for these Monday evenings. And he goes and gets some great speakers. So do you know who next Monday is? Can't tell you. Okay. That's a no yet. He hasn't, he hasn't confirmed it. But, that, <laughs> but hey, we'll be here 8 p.m. UK next week, 9 p.m. European South African. If you've got UK connections, make sure they're on this call. They'll get the energy and the feeling of what Zinzino's doing here in the market. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Steve Morley, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everyone.